Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Scott Erskine. We are starting off this list with truly one of the worst people I've ever heard about. Scott's story starts off when he was a child and suffered an injury that involved his head and brain. He seemed to recover fine physically, but continued to complain of headaches and that sort of thing, and it is unclear if these things were ever looked into further. At a very young age, he began to commit violent crimes against others that I truly cannot even speak about here on YouTube. He spent four years in prison for one of his crimes when he was around 17 years old, but when he was paroled after the four years, he immediately began committing crimes again. In 1993, Scott invited a woman who was waiting for the bus into his home and ended up holding her hostage for several days. After letting her go, he was quickly arrested and ended up being sentenced to 70 years in prison. This is when he had to submit DNA to a database, and in March of 2001, the DNA was matched when the cold cases of the unsolved murders of Jonathan Sellers and Charlie Kiever were reopened. In 2004, a jury sentenced him to death, and six days later, he was transferred to San Quentin. In an interesting turn of events, Scott did die on death row, but it wasn't due to a scheduled execution. Scott died a couple years ago in July of 2020 after contracting COVID-19. In our number 9 spot today, we have Dennis BTK Raider. The BTK killer, whose real name is Dennis Raider, was one of the worst serial killers from 1974 to 1991. He left taunting letters to police and newspapers where he described his crimes, but thankfully his annoyingly large and misplaced ego is what led to his demise. Because he craved the attention so badly, in 2004 he started communicating with the media again to try and be all smug or whatever, but this combined with his utter lack of knowledge on how technology works, led to him being arrested in 2005. Imagine getting away with those crimes for so long and your ego and your own ignorance does you in in the end. During his trial, he didn't apologize for his crimes, but he did describe them in full detail, which is horrifying and honestly very unnerving. After his trial, he ended up being sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences with a minimum of 175 years. When Raider was first arrested and police were taking him to the station, an officer asked him, Mr. Raider, do you know why you're going downtown? To which he replied, oh, I have suspicions why. Ew. In our number 8 spot today, we have Chester Turner. Chester is an American serial killer who, on April 30th, 2007, was convicted of taking the lives of 11 women in the Los Angeles area, and on June 19th, 2014, he was convicted of four more that they were able to tie back to him. He has been referred to by prosecutors as one of the most prolific serial killers in the city's history, and if you know Los Angeles' history with things like that, that is not something to take lightly. In his original trial that led to conviction, Chester was sentenced to death, but at the following one in 2014, he also received an additional death sentence. In the end, like with a lot of these kinds of stories, DNA came to save the day and help authorities find out who was committing these horrible, horrible crimes. In our number 7 spot today, we have Gary Ridgway. This horrible human being is also sometimes known as the Green River Killer, and his crimes took place somewhere between 1982 to potentially as recent as 2001. He was convicted of 49 crimes but confessed to an unbelievable 71, which makes him the second most prolific serial killer in the United States in terms of confirmed killings. Most of his victims were either sex workers or women in other vulnerable circumstances, and through DNA profiling evidence, in 2001, authorities were able to connect him to four of his crimes. From there, they made a deal with him where they would spare him the death sentence in exchange for disclosure of the location of all of the missing women. Gary took the deal and was spared the death sentence, and instead was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Not only did he say that he chose the type of victims he did because they were, quote, easy to pick, and that he, quote, hated most of them, but he also called his crimes his career. I hate him. In our number 6 spot today, we have Charles N.G. Charles' story really starts off shortly after he moved to the United States on a student visa. He dropped out after his first semester, and soon after, he was involved in a hit-and-run accident. He then tried to avoid prosecution by enlisting in the United States Marine Corps, using false documents that stated his birthplace was within the United States. He was arrested by military police a year later for stealing automatic weapons, and then somehow he escaped custody, headed back towards Northern California, and this is where he met Leonard Lake, who is another real piece of work. 
Charles did end up going away and serving a bit of time, but it was only 18 months and then he was back with Leonard, and that is when the two started their crime spree together. It is believed that together the pair took the lives of somewhere from 11 to 25 different people. When Leonard was caught and brought in for questioning, he sneakily took a cyanide pill he had hidden in his jacket and took his own life, but Charles ended up standing trial. He was convicted for 11 of the killings and he remains on death row at San Quentin. In our number 5 spot today, we have Robert Picton. This horrible person is one of the worst Canadians to ever live and is one of our country's worst serial killers ever. Picton dropped out of school and began working at his family's pig farm, and this is where most of his absolutely horrific crimes took place. He was first arrested in 2002 and was convicted in 2007 of taking the lives of six people, but throughout an extremely lengthy investigation, evidence of many more killings came to light. During his time in jail, an undercover police officer posed as his cellmate and Picton confessed to 49 crimes to him. Apparently, he was saying to the undercover officer that he wanted to take one more life to make it an even 50, and that he only got caught because he was sloppy. The entire trial was a bit of a mess, but it led to a life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years, which was the longest possible sentence under Canadian law at the time. This unfortunately does mean that he will be eligible for parole within the next decade, so let's hope that never ever happens. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Golden State Killer. The Golden State Killer is one of the most well-known serial killers ever, and that is never a good thing. From 1973 to 1986, the GSK was responsible for taking the lives of 13 people, harming 50, and 120 different burglaries all across California. Throughout the investigation process, he used different tactics to both taunt and threaten police and the victims, which is just on a whole other disgusting level. Through recent genetic testing, like those 23andMe things, the identity of the GSK was finally revealed after years and years of investigations. Basically, they uploaded a DNA profile that they were able to get from the crime scenes to the website GED Match. They were able to find 10 to 20 people who had the same great-great-great-grandparents as a match. And then from there, the genealogist made a large family tree, and from there, they were then able to single out two main suspects. After covertly collecting DNA samples from one of the suspects and comparing them with the crime scene DNA, they were finally able to arrest Joseph James D'Angelo, who is the Golden State Killer. After decades of waiting, the victims of his crimes were finally able to see justice served as he was sentenced to 12 life sentences plus eight years. He was spared the death penalty because he admitted to numerous crimes that he had perpetrated, some of which he wasn't even being charged for. He is now 75 years old and will definitely spend the rest of his life in prison. In our number three spot today, we have Rodney Alaka. Rodney is a horrible monster who was convicted and sentenced to death for five killings that he committed in California from 1977 to 1979. He also received an additional 25 years to life after pleading guilty to two other killings in New York from 1971 to 1977. Rodney got away with his crimes for a while because he wasn't the top of the list of suspects because he was said to be the quote charming photographer. Rodney is often referred to as the dating game killer because of his appearance on the show which with what we now know about him is absolutely horrifying. What's even crazier is that he actually won the show he was on but the episode's bachelorette refused to go on a date with him because she found him quote creepy. This is it's just a reminder to always trust your instincts. It isn't exactly known just how many victims Rodney had. It is potentially thought that it could be much higher than the number he was convicted for. In July of last year, Rodney passed away in prison at the age of 77. In our number two spot today, we have the Zodiac Killer. This one had to make it on this list today because while there are a plethora of terrifying people on this list, nothing is as terrifying as an uncaught serial killer, and the Zodiac is definitely the most prolific of them all. The Zodiac Killer took the lives of five people in the San Francisco Bay Area between December 1968 and October 1969. He was most known for targeting young couples or a lone male cab driver. Despite two people luckily and thankfully escaping his attempted evil doings, he has still never been caught. He was one of those losers who left notes and stuff for the police to find. I like that they think they're being all cool and clever and brave while they do that. 
Like, if you're so brave and almighty and unafraid, then show us your face. While no one has heard from the Zodiac since 1974, the case remains active in many different countries, and maybe one day we'll finally know who the real Zodiac is. In our number one spot today, we have Robert Hansen. Robert is often referred to as the Butcher Baker, and his story truly is horrific. He is one of the most prolific serial killers in Alaska's history because, for over a decade, he would kidnap women and bring them into the wilderness where he would then stalk them like prey. I am just now realizing that there is definitely an episode of Criminal Minds about this guy. Sometimes the premise is just so dark that it sticks with you. The reason he got away with his crimes for so long is because outside of these horrific things, he was just a soft-spoken baker. One of my best friends has the nicest, most kind bakers for parents, and now I'm starting to feel a little suspicious. Might want to look into them, Robin. Robert was heading to church by day and prowling strip clubs at night looking for the next person to take. What led to the downfall of this horrible monster was a badass named Cindy Paulson who was able to escape from Robert and was sure to leave evidence behind. She then went to authorities and told them what happened and this led to a search warrant for Robert's property, which is where all the evidence they needed lied. Robert is believed to have taken the lives of at least 17 women and in 1983 he was sentenced to 461 years and a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Starting off this list today in our number 10 spot, we have Harold Shipman. Coined with the terrifying nickname Dr. Death, Harold Shipman is thought to be responsible for taking the lives of 218 of his patients from 1972 to 1998. Because of his obvious position as a physician, he was able to fly under the radar for so long despite committing so many of these atrocious crimes. This is, in the end, what led to his downfall, however. Because so many of his patients were were passing away, people started to get suspicious, and this was only exacerbated by the fact that he claimed many of his patients, who were normally elderly women, had passed away in their sleep, but when people started to notice that many of them had actually passed away during the day, people began to get concerned about what sinister secrets may be hiding in the dark. This all coupled with the fact that Harold had asked for an unusually large number of cremation certificates, which ended up catching the attention of a local undertaker, was enough to bring the authorities who began began to investigate. For a while it was believed that Harold should be cleared of all suspicion, until the death of an 81 year old under mysterious circumstances. Her family demanded an investigation because they noticed that her insurance beneficiary had been changed to Harold, which obviously was a major, major red flag. I mean, I love my doctor, but I'm not about to leave them my life's savings, you know? Another thing that really tipped people off is that this woman had passed away shortly after a home visit from Harold despite her being fine before his arrival. They ended up exhuming the body and found that she had actually passed away from a morphine overdose, and the timing of that overlapped with the time that Harold had been in the home. After further investigation, it was realized that Harold also encouraged all of the families of those who had passed away to cremate the bodies, which is exactly why he needed all of those certificates, as well as the fact that he jumped through hoops to assure them that the cause of death he wrote down was the true and real cause. Imagine. <laughs> You're like, I would assume so. <laughs> Thankfully, he wasn't cleared of suspicions and was caught for his terrible crimes. He was tried and convicted of 15 counts of his crimes, but after his conviction, an audit estimated his number of victims to be around 236. In our number nine spot today, we have Richard Ramirez. Richard, who is also known as the Night Stalker, was a serial killer who terrorized the streets of Los Angeles in the 1980s. He was known for his MO of invading homes, which left him initially being dubbed as the walk in killer, but he had another signature that was considered concerning to many people, especially during the height of the satanic panic. Richard was known for leaving behind different satanic messages at the scene of his crimes. Because of his satanic signature, after he left his first pentagram at the scene of a crime, authorities became worried that he was a Charles Manson copycat, but instead he was just his very own kind of monster. It is said that he would leave more pentagrams behind while also telling his victims to swear to Satan instead of God. During his court appearances, he would hold up a pentagram and after pleading not guilty, he said, quote, Hail Satan. In our number eight spot today, we have H.H. Holmes. H.H. is often referred to as America's first serial killer, which just seems like a title no one should ever want to hold. While he confessed to 27 of his crimes, there are some who believe the actual number might be closer to 200, which is absolutely insane. You might be wondering wondering how he was able to accomplish this horrifying amount of crimes, and that is due to his building of a hotel in Chicago. This hotel was designed to be like a maze full of windowless rooms which were intended to make escape.
escaping, almost impossible, which honestly is just a terrifying thought. HH was the only person who knew the entire layout of the hotel, which he purposefully ensured by hiring and firing multiple different builders throughout the construction of the hotel. The hotel consisted of things like secret passages and trap doors, soundproof rooms, doors that locked from the outside with gas jets on the inside. There was also a safe big enough for a human to be put inside of, which unfortunately he did. And there was also a very large chute which he used to get bodies from the upper floors to the basement where there were two huge furnaces, a kiln, as well as a ton of acid. Not only would he get close to women to take control of their finances and then kill them, but he would also require his employees to take out life insurance policies that named him as the beneficiary. Again, a big red flag. Some of the bodies he even ended up selling to medical schools. Eventually he was found out, caught and sentenced to death. It isn't known exactly how many victims he had, but it's thought to be somewhere over 200. In our number 7 spot today we have Luis Garavito. Luis gained a nickname from the media of quote, the beast, and I think that's a great indication of the nature of his atrocious crimes. He is said to be one of the worst serial killers in the entire world, and it is believed that his victim count is up in the 300s range. He confessed to 147 crimes and he was found guilty on 139 of those counts, which put his sentence at 1,853 years, but here's the thing. This trial took place in Colombia, where he lives, and there is a law which puts the maximum sentence to 30 years. He was sentenced in 1999, meaning there's only a few years of his sentence left and there's a chance he could get out early for good behavior. According to Luis himself, he committed these crimes because he had made a deal with the devil, and he explained that satanic ritual was involved in all of his crimes. In our number 6 spot today we have John Wayne Gacy. With a nickname like Killer Clown, it is abundantly clear why everyone would want to stay away from this actual monster. He got his start in this horrifying nickname by being a clown for children's birthday parties, charitable events, and that sort of thing. According to Gacy himself, all of his crimes were committed inside of his ranch house where he would lure his victims into. He would then trick them into wearing handcuffs under the pretense that he was going to show off some sort of magic trick, and from here, the horror unfortunately ensued. It is thought that he took the lives of somewhere around 33 young men, most of which he buried in the crawl space of his home. On the evening of December 11th, 1978, Gacy took the life of his last victim, Robert Peist. Gacy lured the young man in when he went into the pharmacy that he worked at, and while talking with the store owner, loudly declared so that Robert could hear that he often hired teenagers for his firm at a starting rate of $5 per hour, which was double what Robert was getting at the pharmacy. In hopes of getting a new good job, Robert ended up inquiring further after his shift at the pharmacy was over. When Robert's mother filed a missing persons report, the pharmacy owner was able to explain that Gacy was likely the person he went to speak to about the job, and when the police looked into Gacy's background, all the pieces were there just waiting to be put together. Subsequent investigation, questioning, and searches led police to gather all of the evidence they needed to arrest and charge him, and his conviction for 33 killings was, at the time, the most by one individual in the United States legal history. He was sentenced to death on March 13, 1980, and on May 10, 1994, he was executed by lethal injection, and I'm not gonna lie, I just think that's something we can all be grateful for. In our number 5 spot today, we have Albert Fish. Albert is one of the oldest people on this list, but that does not mean his crimes were any less horrific than anyone else's. Dubbed the Brooklyn Vampire, or the Moon Maniac, or even the Boogeyman himself, it is clear that Albert was a terrible human who did terrible things. In the early 1900s, Albert was arrested, tried, and convicted for killing and eating three people, but the horror was not over here. No, Albert began to claim that although people knew about the three, the number was closer to 100, and he even claimed that he had some in every state. That's disgusting. To make matters even worse, as if it wasn't already terrible, Terrible enough, this deranged lunatic also sent a letter to the mother of one of his victims. He detailed everything about how he lured her and the rest of the horrific things that occurred afterwards, like how he proceeded to eat her over the course of nine days. Yeah. This is another person that I am not sad at all that they don't exist anymore. That's perfectly fine by me. In our number 4 spot today we have Sam Little. Sam Little is well known for being one of the worst serial killers ever. He has confessed to taking the lives of more than 90 people, and while authorities have only been able to definitively connect him to 30, they say they have no reason to doubt the validity of any of his other confessions. Sam was able to continue on his horrible path for so many years because of the fact that he committed these crimes in different states and different counties, which made it more difficult 
difficult to connect his crimes to one another. In an interview with an investigator named Sergeant LeBlanc, as they discussed religious beliefs, they spoke about the nature of sin. Sam stated he had no fear of God and said that God made him this way, so why should he ask for forgiveness? He said that God knew everything he did. He also allegedly told a few select people that he believed he was the devil. In our number three spot today, we have the alphabet. There are a lot of scary people on this list today, but some of the scariest out there are the ones we know have committed horrific crimes, but have yet to be identified. Yes, we are talking cold cases, unsolved crimes right now, and we are talking one of the worst. The alphabet killings are a series of unsolved crimes named because of how each victim had their first initial matched their last. So like their first name and their last name started with the same letter. They know these crimes are linked, or at least they have reason to suspect they are because of the similar MO that includes how the life was taken and where the remains were placed afterwards. They were all taken in a similar area around the same time. There are theories and suspects as to who could have committed these horrific crimes, but as of right now, no one knows for sure. These crimes were committed between 1971 and 1973 in Rochester, New York, and because of the timing, it's possible that whoever committed these crimes could still be alive, or perhaps they're not. Authorities, despite having an immensely difficult job placed in front of them, are still committed and trying to solve this case to this day. In our number two spot today, we have Pedro Lopez. Pedro Lopez had a very difficult life growing up, and unfortunately, this led to him living a life committing a plethora of horrifying crimes throughout South America during the 1970s. By the time the 1980s rolled around, as he made a mistake during one of his awful crimes, this led to his arrest. Once in police custody, he spilled everything on basically his entire life and confessed to an insane amount of crimes. Like, we're talking confessing to 240 killings on top of the 110 they already suspected him of. Police were a little skeptical of just how many crimes he said he committed, but Pedro was able to lead them to a mass grave where he recovered a total of 53 three people's remains. Pedro of course went to jail, but get this, he was somehow released in 1994, which is absolutely insane. He was then sent to some sort of mental institution for three years, but then he was also released from there for quote, good behavior. Okay, so aside from the crimes he committed and the fact that they let him go, are you ready for the worst part? Well, in 2002, he was suspected of being the perpetrator of a new crime, but no one has been able to find him since 1998. Yep, yeah, Pedro just disappeared. Great. In our number one spot today, we have Jeffrey Dahmer. This is one man who is exceptionally terrifying because of his actions, but he was also very, very smart, which adds an extra layer of terror to this one. Dahmer, who became known as the Milwaukee Monster, is one of the most prolific serial killers ever, and considering everyone we've talked about today, we know that's not an easy title to get. He became fixated with animals at a young age, and if you're interested in true crime and criminology, you know what happens next and how bad of a sign it is. Dahmer dropped out of business school due to alcohol abuse after just three months and enlisted in the US Army to train as a medical specialist, but that didn't last long either, as he was discharged after he attacked two fellow soldiers. After this, Dahmer fell hard into alcoholism, and this is when his killing spree started. Just to be clear, those two things are not related. I know you know that, but I just don't want anyone to think otherwise. Between 1971 and 1991, Dahmer went on to take the lives of 17 people, and some of the things that came after included the permanent preservation of the body parts, typically all or part of the skeleton. So yeah, things were very, very dark. One of his victims was able to escape and booked it to the police, which is of course what led to Dahmer being caught for his atrocious crimes. When they got there, the chief medical examiner remarked that it was more like dismantling someone's museum than an actual crime scene. That is just how bad it was. In the end, Dahmer was tried and convicted and sentenced to 15 life imprisonments, and in February of 1992, he received an additional life sentence for a crime he hadn't yet been tried for that occurred in Ohio. In a very interesting turn of events, Dahmer was killed behind bars by another inmate in 1994. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Randy Kraft. Also known as the scorecard killer, Randy is a monster who took the lives of at least 16 young men between 1972 and 1983. The scorecard nickname comes from how, after his arrest, police found a coded list that contained cryptic references to his crimes and the victims. On May 14th, 1983, two California Highway Patrol officers observed a car driving erratically and suspected the driver may be impaired, so they pulled it over. Once the car was pulled over, Randy 
Craft got out and identified himself and subsequently failed all field sobriety tests. At the same time, the other officer went over to the passenger side where he sadly found Randy's final victim, 25-year-old Marine Terry Lee Gambrel. The next two days of investigation revealed the horrors of what Kraft had done, and on May 16, 1983, he was formally charged with the one crime, but many more charges came within the next months. His trial first began on September 26, 1988, and on August 11, 1989, the jury rendered a verdict of death and the sentence was upheld. As of this year, he still remains on death row at San Quentin State Prison, where he continues to deny any responsibility for the crimes, like they didn't find one of his victims in the passenger seat of his car while he was driving it. I'm just saying, I don't think he should be waiting around for that Oscar or anything. In our number nine spot today, we have the Long Island Killer. What would a list of horrifying people be without some of the dreaded unidentified serial killers? The Long Island Killer, of course, operated in the Long Island region and is said to have begun being active as far back as 1996, and it's entirely possible that they may still currently be active. At the moment, there is a range of 10 to 17 crimes that authorities believe could be linked to this yet to be identified person. Unfortunately, there isn't much that is known about who this person might be, but it's currently thought that they're likely a white male in his mid-20s to 40s with extensive knowledge of law enforcement operations and techniques, and they believe this because it would make sense as to why he has been so successful in avoiding capture so far. As of right now, it is believed that his most recent victim was Natasha Jugo, who was found on the shore of Gilgo Beach on June 24th, 2013. In our number eight spot today, we have Charles Cullen. This guy used to be a nurse who took the lives of his patients throughout his career, and he may be one of the worst serial killers ever recorded. He confessed to taking the lives of 40 people, but through subsequent interviews, it became apparent that the number was way higher than 40. He just couldn't remember the names of them all. But he, of course, could remember the details of his crimes against them. His crimes started in 1988 and spanned over a decade into 2003. In October of 2003, when a patient at a hospital passed away from low blood sugar, the authorities were called. This person was Charles' final victim, and authorities began looking into him and investigating his past employment history. On December 12th, 2003, authorities were arresting him and charging him with only one count of his crimes, but he ended up admitting to 40. He ended up pleading guilty to his crimes and arranged a plea deal where authorities would not seek the death penalty if he cooperated. During one of his court proceedings, he continuously asked the judge to step down and apparently repeatedly chanted, quote, Your Honor, you need to step down for 25 minutes, even after he was restrained and gagged for his outbursts. It is thought that his victims might be up in the 400 range, which is absolutely unbelievable. Charles was sentenced to 18 consecutive life sentences and will be eligible for parole in 2,403. In our number seven spot today, we have Sean Great. Sean is a serial killer who committed a series of crimes from 2006 until he was apprehended in 2016. Throughout his decade of criminal activity, it is thought that he took the lives of at least five people. So, Basically, his story is a little confusing, but in September of 2016, Sean was arrested and later indicted for two killings, as well as a kidnapping and harming a woman whose 911 call actually led to his arrest. At the same time, in another county next door, he was also being charged with two other deaths, as well as another one from all the way back in 2006. This final count from all of those years ago was actually an unsolved Jane Doe case who had been unidentified for 12 years at the time. When Sean confessed to this crime, he wasn't even sure who she was, he just said he believed her name was Dana. On May 7th, 2018, Sean was convicted on two of the counts, and on March 1st, 2019, he pleaded guilty to two of the others, and on September 11th, 2019, he pleaded guilty to the additional count. In the end, he was sentenced to death and has remained on death row since that final plea and sentencing, and he is currently scheduled to be executed in 2025. In a bittersweet turn of events, in June of 2019, that Jane Doe victim was finally able to be identified through the DNA Doe Project, and she was identified as 23-year-old Dana Nicole Lowry from Minden, Louisiana. It definitely can't bring her back, but there is some comfort in knowing her family finally received some answers. In our number six spot today, we have Tex Watson. Tex Watson was one of the central members of the Manson family, which was led by Charles Manson, and was a willing participant for the horrible Tate and LaBianca crimes that took place on August 9th and 10th, 1969, which if you don't know about them, I can't detail the 
lot of what happened here, but I can tell you that the events that took place on those nights were horrible, gruesome, and insanely unnecessary. In October of 1969, Tex knew his arrest was coming, so he fled to his home state of Texas, but was later arrested and extradited back to California. Once he was in California, he refused to talk or eat and ended up losing 55 pounds, which got him sent to get tested to see if he was fit to stand trial, which he was. In 1971, he was convicted on seven counts of first degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit. He originally received a death sentence, but it ended up being commuted to life in prison. While in prison, apparently this guy's been living the life, however, because he has not only been able to release a book while inside, but he also got married and, through conjugal visits, has fathered four children with his then wife. I actually wish that I was making that up. They did get divorced in 2003, though, because she apparently had met someone else, which I'm like, yeah, I hope so. In our number five spot today, we have David Berkowitz. David Berkowitz, or the son of Sam, is an American serial killer who terrorized New York from July of 1976 to July of 1977. He took the lives of six people and wounded seven others, all the while eluding the biggest manhunt in New York City history. He was one of those arrogant ones who leaves the little notes for the police, promising to do it again. Well, his arrogant self was caught for his crimes, and he was arrested on August 10th, 1977, and was indicted for his crimes. He confessed to all of them and claimed that he was just obeying the orders of a demon that had manifested itself in the form of a dog that belonged to his neighbors. These killers really like to come up with some outlandish excuses. It's so wild. He was found mentally competent to stand trial and he pleaded guilty to his crimes, which left him sentenced to six consecutive life sentences. He later admitted to making up the dog story, which like, oh really? But he did say that instead he was a member of a violent satanic cult and his crime were committed as a part of that. These claims were investigated, but no one has been able to confirm or deny them, and at this point, he's like the boy who cried wolf, so it's just hard to say for sure. In our number four spot today, we have The Doodler. While this nickname sounds very sweet, it, like everything else on this dark, dark list, is very sinister. The nickname that this unidentified killer received is due to his practice of sketching his victims before taking their lives. I told you it was sinister. Don't say I didn't warn you. This identified killer committed their crimes in the San Francisco area from January of 1974 to September of 1975, and they specifically targeted the gay community. It is believed that 14 deaths can be attributed to this killer, while three others were injured in the process. Unfortunately, because of stigma and the sensitivity surrounding gay men at the time, the three who survived this monster were very reluctant when speaking with authorities for fear of being, quote, outed as a result of it. This has led to there being very little information for them to work with in terms of identifying the man responsible. For a while, there was a primary suspect but that person has never been officially charged because, sadly, none of the survivors felt comfortable enough to testify in court. There's a very real chance that authorities know who the killer is, but just don't have the evidence to prove it in a court of law. That truly is a terrifying thought. In our number three spot today, we have Quincy Allen. Sometimes when I'm researching for these videos, I come across somebody that I haven't heard of before, and their story absolutely blows me away, and this is definitely one of them. Quincy Allen is a man who went on a crime spree between July and August of 2002, where he took took the lives of four people. His crime spree was actually inspired while he was in prison serving time for stealing a vehicle. It was here that a fellow inmate decided to start recruiting others and told him that he could get Quincy a job as a mafia hitman. I can't imagine what that's like. Is that like when those MLM girls slide in your DMs? Hey girly, <laughs> you could be making this much a month. <laughs> when Quincy was released, he decided to buy a shotgun so he could start practicing. Man, I wish he showed this kind of dedication to literally anything else. Quincy started off his horrific crime spree on July 7th of 2002 by attacking a 51-year-old homeless man who was sleeping at the time. Luckily, this man was able to survive the attack. His crimes continued until he was arrested on August 14th, 2002. After his arrest and trial, Quincy received a sentence of death and is still on death row awaiting execution. His sentencing did not deter him from the criminal life, however, as in 2009, Quincy, along with another inmate, planned an attack on a correctional officer at the prison they both reside at. In the end, the guards had to use rubber bullets to subdue the pair. The correctional officer they attacked thankfully didn't succumb to his injuries, but he was forced to find another job as after the attack he was suffering from PTSD and anxiety attacks, and all the charges pertaining to this specific attack were later dropped by prosecutors who suggested that there was no point trying someone
someone who was already on death row. This did, however, get Quincy and the other inmates stripped of all of their privileges at the time, which included outside recreation, visitation, phone use, and canteen items. Quincy was intended to be executed on January 8th, 2010, but there was a state of execution that was accepted and a new date has yet to be announced. In our number two spot today, we have Edmund Kemper. Edmund Kemper is an American killer who was convicted for taking the lives of 10 people, including his paternal grandparents, as well as his own mother. He is apparently most notable, I'm gonna say, aside from the fact that he's a serial killer, for his height of six foot nine, and he is apparently quite intelligent with an IQ score of 145. Impressive height and IQ score, less than impressive choices though. His first crime took place when he took the lives of his grandparents. After this crime, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and spent time in a hospital before it was determined he was rehabilitated and he was released at the age of 21. After his release, he unfortunately went on a spree where he would target young females who were hitchhiking. After his final crimes, he ended up confessing and turning himself in, which is something we definitely don't see a lot of the time. When asked in an interview why he confessed, he said, quote, the original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real or emotional purpose. It was just a pure waste of time. I'm just gonna let that sink in. Three court appointed psychiatrists examined and observed him and found him to be legally sane and thus he was able to stand trial. On November 8th, 1973, the jury deliberated for just five hours before returning with a verdict of guilty. He has been eligible for parole since 1979 and has been denied every time he applied, one time saying, quote, society is not ready in any shape or form for me. I can't fault them for that. He is eligible to apply for parole again next in 2024, which is kind of terrifying. I'll agree with him on that quote. We are not ready for you and I don't think we ever will be. In our number one spot today, we have Dale Hausner and Samuel Dietman. Known as the serial shooters, the crimes these guys committed are definitely on the list of fears I have, which I'm pretty sure spawned from my Criminal Minds episode. These two were actively committing these crimes between May of 2005 and August of 2006, and basically they were arsonists who would randomly set fire to objects, but they would also drive around and commit random drive-by shootings. That's the really scary part. The fire thing is also bad, don't get me wrong, there's just something about completely random acts of violence that really scares me. In the end, a series of tips is what led investigators to identify the perpetrators of these horrible crimes, in particular one from a friend of Samuel who explained that Sam had actually confessed to some of the killings one night while drinking. In Dale's trial, he was found guilty of 80 out of the 87 felony charges that were brought forth, and that was all in one single trial. The charges included the killings and attempted killings he had done, arson, animal cruelty, and drive-by shootings. In the end, he was sentenced to death six times, and his brother, who was later found out to have assisted in some of the crimes, was sentenced to 25 years. Samuel was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. While Dale sat on death row, he appeared apparently asked to be put to death, quote, as soon as possible, and in the end, in 2013, he decided to take his own life in prison. To this day, Samuel still remains in prison. Mm -hmm.